Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation, the last book in our modern compiled Bible. And it's very confusing to me, and I think to a lot of people. And the, but the last verse I read makes the most sense to me because I feel God is all. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. God will dwell with them and they will be God's peoples. God will be with them as their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, All is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will freely give water from the life-giving spring. Right, our nurse. So I'm going to go ahead with the second scripture reading. And that comes from Acts. And the Jewish believers are upset that Peter is going to the non-Jewish believers and accepting them in. Peter explains that he can't not accept the Gentile believers because God accepts them in. Now, the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles has also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us, at the beginning, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that they gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance to life. It's a very small step. I have like one square foot to stand. <laughs> I can't get too excited, right? Um, many of you know that my first vocation was teaching. Um, but not all of you may know that I inherited that legacy of teaching from my parents. My mom taught first grade, and from her, I learned to love to read and uh, developed the habit of having 
a very, very full bookcase, whether that was in my classroom or in my office or at home. I have more than one bookcase at home. Um, and my dad uh, was an industrial arts teacher in high school. He basically taught every shop class that it was in existence during the time. And from him, I learned to always carry tools, uh, how to put on the spare when I had a flat tire, and how to change my own oil. I don't do that anymore. But um, And because my first car had a carburetor, so did my second car. Uh, I learned that if I felt like the engine was missing, I was probably due for some new spark plugs or maybe a new distributor cap. Which makes me think of this um, cartoon from one of my dad's favorite comics, Calvin and Hobbes. And if you can't read that, it says, uh, Calvin says, hey, dad, how does a carburetor work? And uh, dad says, I can't tell you. It's a secret. No, it's not. You just don't know how. So many of my teaching friends thought that it was a, an odd sort of vocational jump to go from teaching high school English to, uh, to ministry, but it made perfect sense to me because the, the founder of our faith was a teacher. Throughout the four Gospels, his disciples address him as teacher, and many times he's described as teaching uh, from... Let's see, which is this? Mark, he went among the villages teaching. Every day, he was teaching in the temple. He said these things while he was teaching in a synagogue at Capernaum. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these words, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. Like many teachers, Jesus comes by his vocation uh, his teaching vocation as a legacy from his forebearers. Teaching and study were foundational practices in ancient Israel and in, the t and in the time of Jesus and continue to be important in Judaism today. Jesus embodied the declaration of God in the book of Deuteronomy. These words which I am ordering you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them carefully to your children you are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you are traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. In the Gospels, we see Jesus pass that legacy on to the disciples, giving them authority to teach and heal in his name, which is exactly what the apostles continue to do in the early years of the fledgling church. Immediately after the Pentecost event, the new Converts devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Even prison couldn't keep the apostles from teaching. When the high priest arrested the apostles and put them in prison, during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out, and said, Go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and went on with their teaching. In today's text from the book of Acts, we see Peter teaching at a critical turning point in the new faith. Up until this time, the ministry of Jesus and his disciples was primarily offered to the children of Israel. There are a few notable examples of healings of Gentiles and of Gentiles believing in Jesus, but they are the exception. But in this story, Peter expands what it means to belong to the faith and family of Jesus. And I, I love this picture, which includes a giraffe and a hippo, which um, was not mentioned in the scripture. Uh, Peter's vision confers on him the spiritual authority to welcome non-Jewish believers and to draw the lines of belonging differently. From this point on in the story, the teaching about Jesus and the kingdom of God is offered not just to the children of Israel, but to those outside the Jewish faith as well. The Greek word that's used for all of these instances of teaching is derived from didaskein, 
meaning to teach, and is the root of our English word didactic, which means intended for teaching. And the noun form of didaskein is didache, which is one of the five original vocations of the church that we're exploring this month. I love being upstaged by a baby. <laughs> Didache was of primary importance in the early church, not only because it was a vocation of Jesus, but because it was the primary way that people learned about Jesus and the way, as the new faith was called in the first century. As early as the year 50, decades before the Gospels started circulating, there began to circulate written texts that were instructing new converts and new communities following the Jesus way. The most well-known of these is called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, uh, but is more commonly known simply as the Didache, or the Teaching. This teaching text was so vital in some early communities that it was considered of equal importance with the other apostolic writings that eventually coalesced to form the New Testament. Among other information, the Didache gives basic instruction on the heart of Jesus' teaching, including the great commandment to love God and neighbor as self, um, on the golden rule to do unto others, and the instruction to love your enemies and pray for those who curse you. It also gives instructions on baptism, both what to say and how much water to use, and a basic outline of a communion liturgy, which is quite different from the liturgies that we have from uh, the Gospels and from Paul. And it includes the Lord's Prayer, almost identical to the way we say it today, According to the Didache, though, uh, we are to recite the prayer three times daily. Now, for Jesus and the apostles, and for us today, I would suggest, teaching was not merely about communicating information. It was also a prophetic act. Jesus didn't just spoon-feed data into people's minds. That's what the revolutionary Brazilian educator Paulo Freire would call the banking model of education. You make a deposit of information, and then at some later time, you retrieve the information. Instead, Jesus was encouraging people to make his teaching a part of their lives. He was called to a new vision of how the world should work. He urged them to co-create that new vision, the kingdom of God by radically changing their hearts and their lives and their behavior. His teaching called people to build a society that was not about power over or power against, but that was about power used with and in favor of and for one another and the greater good. It was about building a community of mutuality where all can claim their best possibilities, not only for themselves, but for the whole world. And because this vision of a new world was in direct opposition to the empire of Rome, Jesus' teaching was also a political act. The Christian vocation of Didache, so long as it continues to push against the boundaries, to challenge racism, sexism, classism, and all forms of oppression in the world, will always be in opposition to those in power and will always be a political act. The way I think of it, Jesus was the originator of the teach-in. Think about it. He gathered people around him wherever he found himself, in the temple, in a village synagogue, on the shore of a lake, on a hillside. And he told stories and interpreted scripture and asked probing questions, all related to the more, most pertinent issues of people's lives. The apostles continued this practice, gathering folks around them wherever they went, in the temple, on the road, and even in prison. They continued Jesus' legacy of pushing against the power of the authorities and the empire. 
Those of you who are of a certain age will remember teach-ins from the Vietnam War era. The concept of the teach-in was developed by an anthropologist, Marshall Sollins, of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. And the first teach-in, at least in the modern era, was organized by the faculty and students for a democratic society at the University of Ann Arbor on March 24th and 25th, 1965. This event, which included debates, lectures, movies, and musical events, kind of like Jesus, including all sorts of media that were available at the time, uh, these were popping up, um, let's see, it got national press coverage, and by the following week, similar events were popping up on campuses everywhere. And by the end of that year, there had been teach-ins on 120 college campuses across the nation. Teach-ins continued to be used by the anti-war movement throughout the duration of the war. And teach-ins continue to be used by protest movements today. The Occupy Wall Street movement, remember that from a decade ago? Used teach-ins to educate people about income inequality and the inherent problems of capitalism. In 2015 and 2016, as um, the Black Lives Matter movement held teach-ins to educate about racial inequality well before the protests in 2020 in the wake of George Floyd. At the first Earth Day in 1970, concerned citizens from all walks of life organized environmental teach-ins. And just this year, climate activists held a worldwide teach-in for climate justice, which was held on college campuses all over the world on March 30th. Like the disciples, we are inheritors of this legacy of teaching, this vocation of Didache. The teaching of Jesus, the message of God's love, and the hopeful vision of a new world is ours to make a part of our lives and ours to teach now, not just to our young people in the church, but to anyone who will listen and learn. We need to have our own teach-ins in the church, in the street, in the town square, and on the hillside to teach that message of love to a world that is still desperate to hear it. Amen.